All right, it's even moving. So I want to start by, by quoting Professor Schichtans. Um, as I was preparing for this, I started doing some reading and realized that there's a great deal of overlap with some of your work and mine. Um, and, and because when we work in disciplinarity, I don't think we read sometimes as deeply into our own disciplines as we can. And you, I'm always finding overlaps that are really interesting and very elucidating of our work. So I want to just start with this. Ethical reasoning has to face the challenge and stand the test posed by the actual diversity of affected, situated, and embodied standpoints, perspectives, interests, and meetings. The empirical turn is not a threat to a pure academic rationality, but rather a way to increase the reasonableness and the legitimacy of ethical considerations by expanding the forum, the agora, as Nowotny and others put it, in which they have to demonstrate their persuasive power. And I think this is really important. It's been mentioned that I've been doing empirical ethics since my PhD when I trained with a qualitative sociologist, also happened to be a feminist, who kept helping me understand that empathy was never going to be enough. I could never really understand what it was like to be in someone else's shoes. Um, and, and we drove that work into some of the early work we did on looking at people's experiences of genetic testing. And I started with Huntington's disease, and we added um, BRCA1 and 2 testing and early Alzheimer's. And we were talking to family members about how they decided whether or not to be tested. And this is one woman's response in, coming from the transcripts from our interviews. I consulted my family, and they just all said, it's up to you, mom. And my husband said the same thing. It was just, they left it entirely up to me. It hasn't, at this point, affected their lives. But on the other hand, I think that was one of the reasons that made me decide not to get tested at this point, because I thought it might affect them. People were deciding about whether or not to be genetically tested based on their sense of responsibility to their family. Would it be something that would clarify the situation and help people manage risk, or would it destabilize them in some way? Families who had a recent diagnosis or death by cancer, uh, they, they were worried about people becoming very obsessive about breast self-exams and things like that. People with Huntington's disease were worried that people would make premature decisions about institutionalization. They were very focused in the family. What, what we started to puzzle about, though, is what's the relationship of these very situated, personal, familiar experiences so that what we have should have a policy when it comes to genetic testing and genetic counseling. Of what relevance is this? And what we found, what I had to do, of course, is I was doing the analysis, the qualitative analysis of these transcripts, and I was pulling out the things that I thought were most important for policy. And I found myself in advisories in, in federal and provincial governments doing the same thing, being stuck in the position where I was actually being asked to determine what was in the public's interest. And I kept asking myself, why am I the one who gets to make those judgments. So uh, in her classically sort of in-your-face way, Sheila Jasanoff's got several places where she critiques this. She suggests that bioethics has become one more specialist discourse that conveys a reassuring sense of democratic supervision while giving entrepreneurial scientific and technological imaginations free reign to determine what in effect counts as the public good. And so this sort of makes me think, well, we should do public engagement, and she follows on with that, most paradoxically, even efforts to let publics inside the preserves of decision making have proved only moderately successful in opening up entrenched traditions of decision making. So we'll come back to that. But I, I'm a little more um, satisfied with modest success. I think often in bioethics, we don't change a lot of the decisions, but we're pretty sure they're made better, more thoroughly, more sensitively, more compassionately. And sometimes just moderately opening up the, the corridors of decision making is, I think, a good start, if not, maybe not the end point. I'm not going to go through the events we've done. Again, I just want to, to note that there's quite a range of topics when we do the, this kind of work. Um, and, and what it suggests to many people is, do you think you can have a public deliberation on everything? Isn't there some things that should be ruled out? And the other thing that happens is people look at these, and I'm not sure we always know what we're talking about when we think about deliberation, because deliberation is something that we can do internally as well. And I think Patrick Hamlet captures this sort of processual um, depiction very well. It's not simply to ensure that the excluded groups are given access to decision-making about technology. However desirable this may be in itself, is to express a reasoned, informed, consensual judgment forged out of initially disparate knowledge, values, and preferences of the participants as these evolve through the deliberation experience itself. So it is bringing together diversity 
and, and finding a way through together to recommendations about effectively how we live together, which is a, a theme I'll return to. When I got into this, Susan Sherwin, who's a colleague, a feminist philosopher at Dalhousie, who's, who's retired now, was speaking to the um, Canadian Biotechnology Advisory Committee, and she said what, something that was, seemed really important to me. When we're approaching complex policy matters, we should actively seek out moral perspectives that help to identify and explore as many moral dimensions of the problem as possible. That, that thought experiments and surveys may not get us there, that we really need to engage those moral perspectives. And I, I sort of took that to heart as we were approaching and beginning to design deliberations. But let's go back quickly to the question of, do, can you deliberate on everything? And I think absolutely not. You want to deliberate when it's important for important issues and not spend the time and resources that it takes to run these things unless it's necessary. So clear issues of human rights or legal entitlements, equal pay for equal work. I don't care what a deliberation says about that. That's a fundamental principle that I would want, not want to open up. And we might ask about many other things. There was a couple of provinces in Canada who actually had the gall to take to a plebiscite whether we should honor indigenous land claims that were awarded by the courts. Why would you go to a deliberation for that? You're just going to generate hostility and anxiety. And, and, and what do you do if they say no, because you're legally bound? So there are lots of places where the ethical wisdom or the legal wisdom is enough to give us guidance. There's no point in going there. Sometimes further research will resolve a question. So should we just, how do we justify the risks, the um, restrictions on hazardous substances? Vaping and the, the flavoring of the vaping liquid so that it'll attract young people is one of those cases where it's pretty clear as the evidence begins to develop that we're gonna get, I suspect we can justify pretty strong restrictions and prohibitions on some of these things and we don't need to deliberate those. The, the, the knowledge and the principles we need to make those decisions are there. And I used to say widely polarized issues and use abortion as an example. So if people are genuinely polarized across a wide public, then the getting back to that Hamlet's description of people being holding their ideas loose enough that they'll listen to other people's reasons and maybe move might not happen if we are all members of collectives and you've been studying collectives. So if we have a, a sort of we identity where we won't trade off our position because it's a kind of betrayal of our social group, then we're not gonna be able to get a deliberation going. But then, Ireland goes, of all places, and has a citizens' assembly on abortion and changes their abortion law. So if Ireland can have an abortion deliberation and make a difference, I think I'm probably wrong. It's, it, we have to have, say that there's certain kinds of polarized issues, and I have to do a lot more work to figure out what that is. But suffice to say that, that there's a lot of work and a lot of finances to go in these, and we have to be sure that these are questions that are worth deliberating. I think when we deliberate, we're meaning we're, we're stepping up to a democratic deficit. We're dealing with, as science and technology will tell us, the studies tells us, new technologies create new ways of helping people, new ways of hurting people, risks associated with them, and distributional challenges. How do we get these risks, how do you get the benefits to the right population fairly shared, the same people bearing the benefit of the risks, and what are the lost opportunity costs? And every time we have development, that happens. And when we develop technologies or the policies that, that control them, um, we use public funding to do that, and we shape the future of the public of us as the public. In many cases, I mean, how many of you, none of us, right? So cell phones regulate our lives, it's timing me right now, right? Someone's, well, someone's probably recording on it right now. Others are waiting for calls and have it in silent, but it's vibrating in your pocket. You go out to dinners and all you see is people talking on the phone and, and on the cell phones. That technology has become pervasive in ways we never anticipated. Is it a good or a bad thing? Is it dramatic? But, but technology changes our lives and we don't get a chance to weigh in on it. And often it's driven by dependence on experts and stakeholders. So stakeholders can be industry, that could be patient groups. Experts also are stakeholders, I'm always fond of saying, because we as experts, I'm one, dedicate our lives to contributing to human welfare through the lens of our profession, through the lens of our activities. And so we too have a stake in making sure that if I'm a diabetes researcher, that that kind of research gets delivered in terms of, of translation to, to care. Um, and so making decisions, elected governments making decisions based on input from stakeholders and from experts doesn't really necessarily suggest their decision making is trustworthy. What do we need to do different? How do we live together when we do not all agree? So, uh, so engaging in, in deliberation is something to do when we really have genuine dis, um, disagreement and we have to come to a policy decision and we're trying to figure out how to do that best. Mark Warren, who I'll cite a few times as a close colleague in political science, 
And he says what we're dealing with is limits, and this is the interesting article, is governance-driven driven democracy, democratization, which is what he's calling what I do and other people are doing. And it, the thing I've deleted from this is it's elite-driven. So it's academics like me driving this independent of the electoral system. So for political scientists, that might be a problem. But he says the problem is that we've got increasing pluralism that overwhelms the capacities of electoral systems. That is, being illegitimately elected doesn't carry over to give you legitimacy on issue segmented, on, on issues that come up in the public more widely and cross over jur uh, jurisdictional boundaries. So the public doesn't really trust the elected officials and the, and the delegated um, bureaucrats. And their bureaucrats are often caught again. And so often the deliberations start in part because someone in the Ministry of Health, for example, is saying, we're under pressure from patient groups and from industry, and we're not sure we're looking at the public interest properly. Is this something you can, do, you can do a deliberation on? And that's a very good indication that it's a good topic to take. As Mark puts, this brings into existence, these kind of deliberations, dynamic, serial, overlapping peoples and constituencies. So the political organization of how we engage, and if you want, I, I, I had slides to compare this to some of the literature that you've generated on collectives. We really don't have time to go into it. We could talk about it later. But there's a sense in which this is a, a, a temporary collective organized around democratic principles to figure out how we live together around thorny issues. And again, because the constituencies for these issues are defined by issue rather than by territory, electoral districts, for example, it's possible to draw democratic processes closer to the all affected principle that Gooden has promoted the basic norm of democracy that holds that those potentially affected by a collective decision should have some influence over that decision. And if we segment populations by geography instead of by issues, we don't have that same opportunity. And elected officials and bureaucrats aren't as much in touch with their constituencies to know what their wishes would be on all of those issues. So whose perspective? What do we mean by perspective? How do we do this? Um, in many, and, and, and often when we hear people talk about public engagement, we hear patient and public engagement. And often the organizations that are set up to support them. So we have national funding agencies with considerable resources in Canada, the US right now, funding patient and public engagement, but they're called patient-oriented research. And, and some health policy expert colleagues, um, economists, and I have been at several policy conferences and noticed that health technology assessments are talking about public engagement. And that sounds a little confusing too. So we tried to sort that out. And in many drug and non-drug health technology assessments, patient engagement and methods for such can be utilized to inform the process of evidence generation. If you're gonna say what's the effectiveness of a drug, of an intervention, you wanna know what the illness state is before and after the intervention. And who better to ask? You want objective measures, but you also wanna know what the patient experiences are. And I don't care what the public thinks then. Right? It's, it really matters what the patient experience is. And this enables patient values to be reflected in the HTA report. This is distinct from public deliberation to inform how priority setting can consider the full range of notions of public interest and consider trade-offs that involve using more than assessing a single technology. We've been doing engagements around cancer care and trying to figure out how do we make funding decisions for cancer care, and we've been having public deliberations on that. And now it turns out the, cancer, the costs of treating cancer are increasing so much, the cancer agencies in Canada are reporting that they're having effects on their ability to provide um, supportive care, preventive care, palliative care, survivorship care. And they really think that basically with a 47% increase in cancer diagnosis in the next 30 years, that we're not going to be able to even treat everyone, let alone provide that supportive care. So how do we make those decisions? That's the kind of thing that we take to deliberation. Um, it's in, I found it really interesting when Berger and DeClean are, are citing Althusser talking about interpolation or hailing, which of course is a, in, in the original term, it's a sense that when we call someone as a citizen, we use ideology to reconstruct who they are and control their responses. Um, but when we hail and respond, it really kind of depends on who's doing the hailing. Because the ideology or the authority of the person hailing has shapes my response. And I just think that's an interesting way to think about how we construct the, the citizen or the public when we do deliberations. So we bring people into these things and we frame this deliberation in certain ways and it creates a kind of role. And I want to give you an example from our drug funding scenario and one of our cancer deliberations. So we used a, a kind of a sheet, if you know the street choice experiments, they go through a series of scenarios. We used one for a couple of examples for them to look at. And we asked them, in your opinion, how much extra quality of life 
is needed to fund a new drug at $30,000 per patient over the old drug at $15,000 per patient. Both patients are expected to survive 24 months. So there's no change in length of life, only in quality of life. And they were educated on the quality of life scale and the critiques of it. And so they kind of understood that that was halfway up and it wasn't a great quality of life to be at 50, which is where the person is with treatment. And so they're were, they were asked to go into their small groups and have discussions about that. And we facilitate small groups for diversity. And they come back and they talk in a large group. And, and then we have a break. I'll show you the process in a minute. But a woman came back after the break and said, you know, while I was away over those last 12 days, I went to see my doctor and I've had my third recurrence and it's, it's untreatable. I'm, I'm, I'm terminal now um, and I'm going on palliative care. And so she was asked this question. And she starts off, I think you're right. For myself personally, 60, 10 points on the quality of life scale, I can live with. So that's speaking as a patient. But if I'm looking at the cost, which this whole thing, this deliberation is about, I think you're right. Someone else has suggested 70 per cost-wise makes more sense. You know, if I, if I took the cost out, I would live with 60. I would take anything. But cost-wise, to make the decision relevant and beneficial for more people, you know you have to look at it that way. In seconds, this woman had gone patient to citizen to patient to citizen creating a position that, of authority in the sense of telling a narrative of her own illness and then saying, but as citizens, I think we have to insist on more than that amount for this payment. So what we ended up from this deliberation was clearly indicating to decision makers that an informed deliberative public were quite willing to say that you had to get good money for your value when you start getting more and more expensive cancer care. And of course, now we're looking at CAR-T and things that are looking like about $450,000 per patient. This is our deliberative process. And I just I use this slide because it kind of graphically and quickly tells you how we work this. So we recruit 25 people, sometimes it's 32, sometimes it's 23 with dropouts. And we pre-circulate electronic and printed media. It takes us about eight months to do a lit review and put together these 18-page booklets that are written at a 10th grading reading level, which seems right given the self-selection of people who come to these things. Um, we have two weekends separated by 10 days. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I actually had commented coming in that I would appreciate if someone told me exactly that, so thank you. Um, absolutely no offense taken, and I apologize for that. So what we do is we recruit people and give them advanced information. We bring them in for one weekend, two days, and the first bit of it is really experts and stakeholders. So these people, the experts and stakeholders, are not participating in the deliberation, but they are informing the deliberation. The, they're telling things, explaining things that if, they, if the public didn't get them, we would think it was not a well-informed deliberation. But they're also passionate. We're asking to convince people that there really is an issue worth considering here. There's another piece of technology we were talking about. <laughs> We do a 12-day break. This is expensive and this is unusual and people always ask us, do you need to do this? And I've tried it without. I think it's effective. If you put people in a room for two days and on Sunday at 3 o'clock say, do you, still, do you disagree with this? People are going to start to agree because they want to get out. It's time to go. And they've, not, they've been thinking with a bunch of people who are asking for reasons and they might start to make agreements that when they leave and they go home, they go back to the community, their families, their work, their church, wherever they go, they may say, well, why did I agree to that? Just because they seem so forceful. And so we have them go back, and some of them say, I just slept, I had a headache, I didn't think about it again. And others say, I had a, a coffee group that met me, or we went at the bar, or we had a family reunion, we had a talk, and they bring back those other perspectives. So that's, that break is, is kind of gold. They also come back refreshed, and we don't lose many people. If they don't come back, there's always a good reason. Um, and I think what they end up is very committed and, and having a sense of solidarity here as a collective wanting to make these contributions. We move, as I said, I think between small and large groups. Small groups are, small group, are intended to be groups where everyone participates and the facilitators facilitate for diversity and to avoid conclusions. Do not deliberate in a small group because it's really frustrating to then go back and deliberate in a large group 
and there's a tendency for small groups to balkanize and defend their group identity. Collectives form very quickly in these kind of events, and we don't want them to form a collective as a small group. It's only in the large group they deliberate, and as, as you saw, as it rolled out, we have reports, and our first report is always a report of the, of the conclusions of the participants, not our analysis, then we have other analyses. But when there are decision makers in the room, often there are to receive the recommendations, they often leave with information that they start acting on right away. And I'll give you some examples later, but we're finding the transformation actually sometimes happens in the room. Um, and sometimes that's a little, a little haunting because you're not sure, you want to do some evaluation of the deliberation and that will look for whether there's any factors that were biasing it. But they leave with this sense of the public that we've heard is worthwhile paying attention to. The, the Mark Warren, again, coming back, is, is talking about what we're trying to get from these kind of deliberative events. What matters most from the perspective of democratic representation is that the processes include an inclusive sample of interests, values, views, and opinions of those potentially affected, as well as have the capacity to render advice or decisions that responds to those affected. Representation, representation can be designed to include marginalized people and unorganized interests, as well as latent public interests. And so it's those last two that become, it's one thing to have marginalized, and sometimes I don't, I don't think we get a good, do a very good job of getting marginalized people in the deliberations because it's difficult, and we do try to do that. But the fact that people haven't organized around a single interest about the issues we're talking about suggests that they're not very interested, they haven't seen what their future interests are, and that's the, what we mean by the latent interests that they would hold once they understand how a technology would begin to shape them. And remember, we're working in areas of biobanks, areas of cancer drug funding, decision making, big data. But what do we mean by a perspective then? What, what's to be brought into these as a perspective? Karperwitz and Raphael suggest that perspective bears are relevant to an issue, and we do. We, we recruit and we identify people we want relative to an issue. So when it was environmental remediation of RDX, military explosive, we wanted to make sure we had people, and we were talking about the possibility of using genetic modified foods, we wanted to make sure we had people who are anti-GM and people who had military experience with RDX. When we worked in fisheries, we wanted to make sure we had people from certain kinds of fishing villages that were dependent on aquaculture as well as traditional fisheries and, and indigenous fisheries. And as Young says, it begins with our experience, history, and social knowledge, and that structures our perspective. And we can't assume that there's common interests across those perspectives, or even that within a perspective, those interests will be common. We still have to dig those out in the deliberation. And we need enough participants that the diversity of views can be heard. So some of the, the literature, I'm, I'll, I won't go into a lot of detail on, but that someone uses later in this presentation, for decision making, the contribution of decision making in business decisions, the suggestion is not good enough to have a token representative. It's really crucial that if you have women involved, you have enough women that they support each other in, in articulating their views. Whatever the minority or the marginalized group, it's crucial not to have one, but to have enough that they can support each other and their view or perspective can be fairly presented. So this is the, the other way of looking at representation. So Dan Steele is a philosopher of science who I've worked with, and Dan wants to characterize the broad concept of diversity and inclusiveness across all contexts. Biodiversity, business decision making, uh, sustainability, he's trying to characterize it at that level, including how we use it in, in political science. But he came up with, with, I think, what was a useful, it's been useful for me anyways, set of concepts. And, and the question of the diversity is, how do we want those, dis, those characteristics distributed in the group we recruit to be the deliberation participants? One way of thinking about it is egalitarian. So I've taken arbitrarily Abilene Christian University, because on their chart they have a nice graph that's not protected and they said that it's, uh, we can use it. And so you can see that they're made up majority of the Church of Christ, majority, the largest group, not majority, and they have smaller denominational segments. And if we want an egalitarian representation, if we're doing a student engagement, we, wouldn't, we would want the same number of people from each of those categories, because we want them all to be represented. And as I just said, we want enough there so that they can represent their perspective. So we'd probably want two or three or four in a small group from each of those perspectives. But notice that that's not representative. A representative sample is when the, the group we recruit is the same as the population we're referring to, so the chart would be the same, both for, just smaller numbers, both for the sample as, for, as well as for the population. 
But this one is kind of interesting. He, Dan calls it normic because there's a kind of a norm operating here, a correction. And we might want to correct for a lack of diversity in the reference population. We might say that we probably never will hear from the Catholics and Methodists. We wouldn't get them showing up in a representative sample. And so we actually want to make a real point of, of over-representing them. And, and probably the best example for me is we always include indigenous people. No representative sample of 25 to 30 would have a st statistically would include indigenous people. But we want to include them. We want to include them for several reasons. And they end up being very good resources. Thank you. They end up being very good resources because they use this form of narrative warranting very effectively. And so there's, there's reasons to have them there as well as making sure they represent um, one of the views that are important to civic society. So we're bringing people in for what I want to call their public expertise. Uh, I had a different slide here that I decided to com that com the uh, humor wouldn't work. So this one is not as funny, I hope. But sometimes we think when we bring people in, we're trying to train them so they can help us make the decisions that we're trained to make. As it were, making them mini-me's, mini-scientists, mini-ethicists, mini-this or that, so that you get a quick education and, and you'll help me with my problems. And I have to wrestle with people who want the input on policy to say, is that a question that's reasonable to ask the public, given the public expertise? And remember, we construct what we want to get from them by the way we construct the questions. So how do we want to do that? What is the expertise we're drawing on? Well, one of the things we're drawing on is that we want a diversity of life experiences. We want every person to bring in their life experiences and their goals and their, exp their experience with making trade-off decisions and, with, with their, and their familiarity with negotiating diverse interests. If you've had children, if you've got aging parents, or if you've got siblings, you've certainly had negotiations around trade-offs and, and, and stakeholders, but many of us in many aspects of our lives have to do that. That's a fairly natural thing that we do as members of the public. We do want values, but not just values. I'm often asked by people in health, can you tell us what Canadian values are with respect to healthcare it, by a deliberation? I, mean, I don't even need a survey, let alone a deliberation for that. They want effective healthcare, they want equitable access. I mean, the, the values are really clear. What's not clear is when you can't afford to provide everything, what's an equi equitable distribution then, when we have to make these trade-offs. So we want our citizens to come in surely with their values, what we're really after is how do they trade those off? What are the different ways in which they think how important something is when they have a trade-off decision? And we want practical knowledge about our own world. We had one event where it was around biobanks, and one of the um, recommendations came from a participant discussion that basically was using common sense and knowledge about how they'd respond to being approached to be in a biobank. And the suggestion was, well, we could use posters, or we could put things up on the wall, on the wall or in the paper, or we have pamphlets, so you can know what it is before we start to ask you about it. And they all said, no, we want our doctor to tell us about it. So the pathologist who was in charge of this said, you know, I have to tell you that we couldn't get doctors to sit down and learn about biobanks, let alone spend time to tell you about it. That's just not a realistic recommendation. But what about a compromise? We have technicians who set them up, who recruit, who process tissues, who know everything there is to know about it, and they could answer all your questions. What if they're the person who talks to you about it? And I said, that sounds good. Six months later, they published a statistically in, a significant increase in accrual rates because of that suggestion. And that just came from practical knowledge, just from people's sense of being in the world and talking to each other about what they need to be, feel reassured. I do, I've mentioned narrative warranting a bit, so I think it's probably worth talking about that. So when we're looking for people to give reasons, we often think in terms of sort of enlightenment rationality, syllogistic reasoning, giving a reason in support of a conclusion. In the Delegmuk case in Canada, it was a land claim case where they were arguing about what the scope of a land claim was for nomadic people who walked and buried their dead and hung the placentas of the births and trees. And, and so they had to tell these stories about where they went. And the Supreme Court of Canada accepted narratives as a form of evidence which, for the first time ever. And it was it's quite fascinating. So, um, Angelia Means is writing about this. And she says, narrative frames do not just provide the form for argumentative content. It's, just not, an, it's not merely an entertaining or an engaging way of presenting an argument. But the, the, the normative, the, the frame, narrative frame and the argument content are so richly interwoven that if we bracket the narrative and try to extract the, the argument, we'll just never hear the actual argument that's being made. In particular, we'll be unable to hear the reasonable arguments of various cultural strangers. So what she argues is that transformations of subjects happens 
of us as subjects through exposure to stories. They're not reducible to our own case and requires an effort to identify with them. So we build empathy in that way. And what, we, what we're doing is we're creating the, the possibility of thinking with others. So there's a sense in which what we're doing is we position ourselves as a subject and then we tell that story. And the woman who came back with terminal cancer was an example of that. But this one comes out of the Ontario vaccine uh, deliberation, a little poke in case you want to come back to vaccine uh, um, policy and our deliberation on that and the questions. But sometimes people put themselves in a position to explain how they come to a conclusion. And that's a good enough reasoning. So we had a, a deliberation on mandatory childhood vaccination. And at the end, there was unanimity to support mandatory childhood vaccination and disallow religious exemptions and personal conviction. So they only wanted medical exemptions allowed. And there was a great agreement on that. But where the group fell apart is when they were talking about how draconian the measures should be in our society. How do we put parents in jail? Do we find them? Do we prohibit children from coming to school? What do we do to force this? And, and one of the speakers, who, and one of the participants who was, I have to admit, a fairly articulate speaker, said, since I came to Canada, he emigrated from Britain, I've been impressed by the inclusiveness, the way different people are accepted. So I wonder whether we can find a way to achieve herd immunity without punishing parents who sincerely believe that they're acting in their children's best interests. And it didn't swing the group. They didn't agree. But you could see a few other people backing off their heavy-handed approach, and it really clearly stated that there was a real disagreement. And that's where the action has to be. That's where we have to spend our time on policy, is figuring out not whether or not it should be mandatory, how heavy-handed we're going to be in our enforcement. What kind of a society would we be? We apprehend, many of us, Jehovah's Witness children to give them blood transfusions. Are we really talking about apprehension for vaccination? So, so I think that's wh where we should be making the arguments instead of all the arguments we see in the ethics literature about whether or not it's mandatory. It wasn't even an issue once the, these people spent two weekends on it. And, and narrative and ethics of care kind of have gone hand in hand and, and there's different approaches to it. One of the things about, about narrative is we're trying to avoid privileging argumentation that fails to em empathize, as, as Means was saying, if we extract the argument, we may not still get the humanity and the empathy that we need and that we can get from the narrative. Um, and when we seek warrants, we may push participants into giving rationalizations that don't characterize their real reasons they're holding the position. Um, in, in a seminar earlier this week, we were talking about this, and I talked about some of my work with clinical geneticists who would complain that parents were coming and asking for terminations, early terminations, for cleft lip, cleft palate, and polydactyly. And they said, why, why are they terminating for such trivial reasons? And so I said, well, why do you think that's their reasons? Well, that's what they told us. So, well, you're a medical doctor. Do you think they're going to tell and give you their financial or emotional reasons? They have a, 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 a pregnancy that they do not want. And for whatever reason, they're, they're seeking your assistance with that, and they're going to give you a reason that they think is something that you will have to pay attention to. And I, I'm working with Susan Cox, who's an anthropologist, or sociologist, actually, in, 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 at UBC. When I was doing focus groups with her, with Huntington's folks, she would say, quit asking the why question. You're just making people feel on the spot to justify themselves to you. Ask them how they come to the position. And it elicited these narratives that were far richer, and we, you saw one of them earlier. It was a much better way of approaching this. And so in these cases, it might be a shortcut to ask why, but actually asking how is very important. And it's really an attempt to understand participants and social groups' situated understandings. And it's not that I have to understand it, because I'm not the one making these conclusions. It's that the people who are deliberating need to be able to understand these different perspectives. One of the things that, that I think we wrestle with is the, the role that participants play in outputs. So there's so many different, there's probably over 100 different ways of deliberative that have been published on deliberative engagement of publics. And I, I, let's start with one that, where people actually do focus group analysis of deliberations. And we've seen people actually cite our, our method, our approach, and then they don't report any of the recommendations. They identify themes, themes that they think are important and their relevance to policy. Well, that's a kind of analysis, but that's a focus group analysis, and it's not letting the, the participants' contributions take the lead. If you look at Jim Fishkin's deliberative polling or the patented Jefferson Center citizen juries, they have a set of propositions that they present to the participants, and they vote on them, and then they have the deliberation, and they don't make recommendations. 
they vote again as individuals. So they have a pre-post poll, and the change in the results shows the effect of deliberation on opinion formation, and that's what Jim delivers to policymakers. This is what a public would think if they were informed, deliberative, and civic-minded. These are the changes you'd see. And so that's what they want to deliver. We, we try to do something different. We try to present this number three. We try to get the participants to move towards consensus, though we don't insist on consensus because I think that's too high a bar and it, it often distorts. Um, but majority conclusions. And, and so we try to get them to move in, in the sense, in their own words, say what their advice is to the decision makers in the areas where we're asking about for policy advice. Uh, some people go further. Some people actually take the trouble to support the participants to actually write the report. I've seen a few of those. Very impressive, very time consuming, and, and I think maybe sometimes a heavy demand on the participants, so we haven't done that. But I just want to point that the degree of participant control increases as you go on that list. And sometimes, for some things, maybe you know you've only got three options, and a deliberative poll or, or a citizen jury with those options is the way to go. So there's not a right or a wrong way, but the, the extent to which you want them to actually have control over the conclusions they present means that you shift your method and your approach. I keep talking about persistent disagreement, and I want to really make it a, a fine point on this. When people who've worked together for three or four days, coming to agreement, and, or convergence anyways, converging on recommendations, find things they don't agree with, that's really important. And it's important not to wash those out or to drop them because, well, we couldn't get agreement there, so let's not talk about it. Those are actually some of the most important points. We're saying to policymakers or to decision leaders or practice leaders, this is where you need to spend the time. Okay? It identifies areas where we just need to do more work. I, I gave you the one example, I think, with the penalties with respect to vaccinating children. Um, but commercial involvement is an interesting one. Whether we're talking about biobanks or the use of epidemiologic data or electronic health records, People tend to think that science is a good thing as they start to understand the benefits. They're willing to loosen up the grip on control of privacy because they want to see ready access. They're concerned that we might not get to urgent access when we need it. Um, but then when you introduce the idea of commercial partners, commercial use, the idea of profit, it's not that everyone agrees. It's that they start to really disagree among themselves. Some people will say, accurately, that without private investment, we're not going to get the same innovation systems that we have now. And others will say, and we need industrialization. We need someone to take the, me the medicines that are designed in universities or in labs and scale them up for delivery. And so that's how we get the benefits from them. And others will say, yeah, but those profits are pretty high. And, and, and doesn't that reduce availability because we can't afford it? And aren't we concentrating wealth further in our society by the way we do this? And so the commercialization means many things. But it says to us, when you want a trust, a public trust in a biobank, in the way you use data, you're going to have to really deal with the issue of commercialization head on and be very clear about it and, and know that you're not going to please everyone. But to be clear that that's where some of the work has to be done. Brian Wynn and others, have, and, and Sheila Jasonoff, have really criticized our approach um, for something it doesn't do, and I admit it doesn't do it. And so we've argued that, that we should be doing other things. Event-based, they call it, event-based deliberations do not change power. They do not put the public in a position to an ongoing basis deal with the emerging issues that we're trying to govern. Um, and so the, the, the challenge here, we said in biobanks and then generally in terms of biotechnology has always been how do we introduce a mechanism in the governance so that there can be ongoing public input of the quality that we get from some of these deliberative events. Um, we've seen this happen actually out of the deliberations. So our first deliberation, the Mayo and Biobanks, led to the Mayo Clinic actually asking for participants from the deliberation to form an advisory who began to advise on return of research results, incidental findings policy in genetics and genomics, and help govern whole genome sequencing. And then in 2011, we did the Rochester Epidemiology Project, which is one of the longest standing identified epidemiologic databases that did a lot of the original work on secondhand smoke. Um, and there was a privacy movement in Minnesota that really was threatening to shut them down, and they had to send letters out for people to have the opportunity to opt out, um, and the, the response rate was low, and so they were actually concerned that people might want to opt out, and they, they didn't know. So what, what should our position be in terms of privacy and use of that data? Let's have a deliberation. And the NIH investigator in charge of that project at the end stood up and said, our board 
is going to consider all of your recommendations and all your concerns. And we're go we already accept the, the recommendation for ongoing advisory and let us know in, on, on the, your notes which one of you are willing to be part of that advisory. That's been so successful at the Mayo. Now, you probably know this, but the Mayo is one of the most bureaucratic hierarchical institutions in medicine. It's very expert driven. I mean, I, I wouldn't be able to walk the halls as a staff member dressed like this. I have to be dressed more appropriately than that, more, more professionally. For them to adjust, to adapt this is interesting. They have now trans, they've now taken this approach that's established in Minnesota and repeated it in both Arizona and Florida Mayo Clinics. So it's a kind of a, a very interesting that, that they were able to take this up the way they did. We've, we've always asked people at the end of our deliberations, what would make decision making in this area trustworthy? And we've got very little substance. So what we've done in this case, in this last deliberation, is we gave them some examples. Here's the Nice Council, the Nice Council in Britain, and here's another one. Here's some models. What do you think? And they had a deliberation on that. Um, what are the features, we said, of an ongoing citizen's advisory? And they had recommendations. They had recommendations that were heartening to me. They said the advising group should have diversity of perspectives instead of population representative. They really thought that sort of normative, we didn't use those terms, of course, approach was important. They said it's necessary the engagement be face to face. We were sure they were going to say it can be online. And they said no, because first of all, we won't take it seriously. We'll be playing solitaire off the side or playing a game. And, and we can't understand and we won't hold each other accountable to be respectful listeners if we're online. We have to be face to face. Maybe some of them said a second or third time we could be online, but you, you have to be online. And the surprise was they wanted a full membership shift every time. They didn't want to hang on to experienced people on the advisory because they said the power differential between the experience and the inexperience would be too great. And they just really, and, and there wasn't, a, that wasn't a strong agreement. There was probably, from the numbers, probably about 20 some out of the 23 or 24 people were, were leading towards that. And then they wanted a budgetary commitment. And we're going to repeat this, that question in those discussions in an upcoming deliberation. So let me just kind of start to wrap up here. Really conclusions, informed civic-minded input from a diverse small group of the public may enhance policy decisions. If the goal of bioethics or the goal of deliberation is to enhance the way we make and make decisions better, I think this is something that contributes to it. It may be a modest contribution, but I think it's a worthwhile one. It increases direct and inclusive public participation in deciding the public interest. And it takes me out of the hot seat where somehow I'm supposed to represent all these marginalized populations that I can't possibly even understand. It's complementary to it. does not replace expert and stakeholder input. Those, those activities will still be there. But because they're there and because they're influential, we need something else to represent the, a wider public. It increases political legitimacy. Probably some of the citizens' assemblies in, in Ireland for abortion, that was probably a pretty in, in, important one. It extends bioethics into a wider discourse because really we organize the materials, the topics, the discussions around how do you get people to have bioethics discussions. And they look a lot at, at first like some of your introductory bioethics courses where you're trying to get people to think and listen to other perspectives. So some of those is, is very similar. It's, it's a kind of a comfortable move. People facilitate from bioethics background very easy in those contexts. And it's a kind of a nonpartisan political action with uh, democratic aspirations. So if it's, it's not partisan in the sense that we're not trying to promote one particular perspective, but we are trying to promote a kind of democratic aspirations. So I want to close with this quote, a process model of morality, which I think this is, conceives of morality as a living thing, a continual interpersonal process of holding ourselves and others to account for what we value, negotiating responsibilities, making ourselves morally intelligible, constructing and reconstructing our moral views of how best to go on together. This is a model of participatory ethics in which all actors are involved in a collaborative mode of deliberation. I think we should go to questions now. Thank you. So thank you very much, and I already see the first hand raising, so I guess we still have to go on. Thank you. Thank you very much. At the beginning of your talk, um, you said that there are certain areas or certain topics um, that are um, that are uh, 
not appropriate for de uh, deliberation, like, uh, for example, uh, human rights principles. And I was wondering, what we're experiencing uh, right now in several countries is that those very um, areas or those very issues are hotly debated again, um, especially with all this uh, right-wing uh, populism and uh, uh, um, uh, things like that. So I was wondering, where's the criterion? Where do we draw the line, or what is the criterion for drawing the line between what is negotiable, what is a, uh, a part of a, del de a deliberative process, and what, is, uh, what has to be left out? So human rights are traded off against other human rights. They're not, there's no one human right that's the big trump, and, and we do can't use that word anymore, can I? That's the bit that counts more than others. Um, so when human rights are in conflict, that's a place where there's often moral disagreement, and it might be a place where you want a community response that says, here's, how we, here's the balance we can accept. The human rights, as I was talking about, is in those cases where there's clear violations of human rights, you don't want to take that to a populist, any kind of a populist discussion. So, so that's, that's the real concern. And I think often what we see is um, people resorting to plebiscites think Brexit, when really you need a level of expertise to make decisions and people aren't empowered with any sort of expertise and adequate knowledge, so you get a popular vote that reflects the same thing you would get if you did a survey, which is unreflective, knee-jerk responses. And that's not how we should make good policy. So, so there's different ways of doing it, but I would say that, and they have done a, there has been a, a deliberation on Brexit with an equal proportion of people for and against it to what's in the population. It was representative in that sense, and it did not support exiting the EU. So, so those models have been run, but of course, it's not going to make much political difference now. Thank you. Thank you very much for your speech. Um, I'd be interested in the method you use, um, because the method you use for those deliberations involves some form of control over the participants, but how do you try to cancel out any form of bias of the ones designing the deliberations? So we, we don't, I'm a qualitative researcher, bias is inevitable. Uh, we frame very explicitly, we frame specifically to stimulate diversity and open discussion. Um, the facilitation is one where we, I mean, when I facilitate, I use the word uh, mutiny, I mean, we encourage the participants to take over every, any part of the process they want. But we say, here's the framework, here's the, the sort of scope that the decision makers want. But if you, and we had, for example, in, a, in the cancer drug funding, one of the first concerns, we did this across Canada in, in six centers. One of the first concerns that always came up is, how come we're not talking about prevention? Isn't it better we prevent cancer than have to spend so much money in treating it? And it was really out of scope. So we had to put it on a parking lot and come back to it later for people to raise. So what we try to do is av avoid the biases of the way we frame the questions from determining what the participants can make recommendations on. But we, we recognize that we co-create. This is what we call this a co-creation because this isn't them making this. These aren't naturally occurring occurrences. This isn't easy. People don't do this naturally. We frame this, we've created it, we facilitate it, and they know that's what's happening. We, ha we have them help us set up rules of respectful listening. I mean, I wasn't looking carefully, but I bet a few of you rolled your eyes a couple of times during my talk or shook your head. Very normal habits. But when you're in an intense group of, of, of lay people trying to articulate their views on something that's new to them, you really want them not to exhibit those kind of behaviors. So they know that they're being carefully controlled and they'll rebel against that. And we always have social outliers who constantly push us. And so they can decide whether they want that to be something that the whole group follows or not. So it's, I hesitate to call it a methodology because uh, we had this discussion earlier this week. It's not driven by a theory. All the, all the components is too complex to think that it's driven in any way by a single theory, a theoretical perspective. But it certainly is a social constructivist perspective. It views the, the production as a co-creation. It recognizes the framing we put in in every aspect of the information the speakers we choose, the way we facilitate, the, the way we organize the room, and then we try to make sure that the participants are aware of that effect and let them decide how they want to deal with that. Dr. Burgess, thank you for your um, rich presentation. Um, you mentioned that in some deliberations, uh, you have decision makers coming in, listening, and taking the results back out. 
Um, is it possible that Canadian politicians are a sort of an enlightened, especially enlightened group of politicians? I, I, in our experience, we, in deliberations, it's been very difficult to integrate uh, anyone with uh, real decision-making authority. We've uh, maybe you could just speak to that uh, about the party system in Canada. What, what kind of decision makers that w they were, and what your experiences have been. So when we write grants, which is often the way of supporting these, sometimes these are funded by departments of health, and sometimes these have been funded mostly by research grants written by the countries where we're doing them. When we write them, we have decision maker collaborators on the grant that have agreed that this is an area they want help with, and have agreed to review the materials and make sure they think, so you're not just trying to inform the public who are participants, you're trying to create credibility with the critics by making sure that anything they think they need to hear was in the book and was covered in the talks. So they have a sense of, of where this is going. And then we ask them to come when we can get them to receive the results, and we have a panel, and they can respond. And I talked about how, how one of the pathologists reshaped one of the recommendations. Um, I think some of them are quite enlightened, but what's really interesting is some of them come, I think, pretty skeptical. And most of them leave pretty transformed. I mean, it's pretty easy to go to town halls or go on blog sites and think that generally when you think about people who are the public on these issues, they're just kind of idiots who quickly draw conclusions and don't think very carefully about alternatives. Um, those are the same people in these deliberations. But what the, I think the, the policymakers and practice leaders leave with is a sense that you can engage the public, but you have to do it in an appropriate way. The, the critiques are usually, you know, how can this be representative? And that's where Dan's point has, has been really useful to, to making that clear. Um, we're getting bureaucrats. We're getting mid-level bureaucrats. So we, we might get a deputy minister of health. We'll get the head of cancer agencies provincially, the head of organizations nationally. Um, but we're not getting elected officials. We, we, uh, they do ask me about it, but they are not the ones who are going to show up. They could start these. There have been elected officials who've tried to get do town halls, and they could initiate some of these events if they wanted to. Thank you very much for your interesting presentation. Um, my question is a bit more general about uh, participatory research. Um, I have the impression that there is an in inherent tension in this um, increasingly um, uh, promoted participata participatory research in the sense that it becomes more and more demanding. There are more meetings, more people needed, more inclusivity or, or you know, so in your method, it's two weekends, maybe that is not so demanding, but especially in um, technology development, uh, co-creation um, is often promoted as the right way to do it, which means that publics are involved in every step of the development process. Um, the tension that I, that I feel in that is that um, these uh, methods are meant to be inclusive, right? To make the development of these technologies, or for example, a set priority um, inclusive of all different views. Um, with, the, with the increasing amount of um, uh, meetings or the increasing demandingness, aren't you actually also excluding actually people? Um, for example, minorities or people who cannot make the time or the, the, the means free to come to these meetings and to contribute to represent their own perspectives. Thanks. Many things to respond to there. Um, first, I want to go back to the point that I don't have a perfect approach. I have something that I think improves decision making a bit, and, and for some decisions, it's a good thing to do. One of the reasons that the political scientists suggest many publics like this are the way to go is because they worry about exhaustion. If you try to get too many of the publics involved in too many of the issues all of the time, they'll exhaust and get, become apathetic. Um, in some ways, that's what we're seeing already. Uh, I'm more concerned about the superficiality of many of the engagements. I'm more concerned about the way we bureaucratize this, and it ends up being something that you can hire someone to do without taking it too seriously, receive the report, and then do what you want anyways. And the pencil whipping of, you know, we've consulted indigenous people, now we've had a public deliberation, we've had focus groups with various marginalized people. That's a worry to me. Um, and then their self-selection is inevitable. As much as Fishkin says he has a population-based representative sample, he works off lists of voters that doesn't include all of the population. He has self-selection operating every bit as much as we do. And so we get people in the door. So the, one of the deliberations going now being set up in London on the use of the 
health, uh, electronic health care record from the NHS for research. Um, the company putting that together has, is conducting now 64 focus groups with marginalized people in London who they believe will self-select out of doing a deliberation to get the kind of themes from those groups that they will then introduce to the deliberation. So there's kind of interesting experimentation, I think, going on with how to be more inclusive if, if the deliberative approach won't reach everyone. Um, so I think we have to be clever about that, depending on the urgency of the issue and, and uh, how much we're willing to invest in it. Uh, uh, coming back, is that, would you, what, what would be your precision? Does it make sense to have public deliberations on these very broad general issues, like even future technology developments that are not yet at place, but we might consider that can be relevant, like nanotechnology was very interestingly discussed, whether there was a hype of making a discourse where we don't yet know what exactly it means for practical questions, or is exactly also this important to have the public engaged in very, very early stages, and, and what could we learn from that? So I took those slides out to shorten the talk so I could talk more slowly. Um, Brian Wynn and others have, for, have argued with us that if you engage too late in the development process, the economic interests and the design choices have already been made and there's not much for the public to negotiate. And so if you push it upstream, you have the economic interests aren't locked in, the design choices aren't made and you're more likely to be able to shape the technology rather than decide how to implement it. And that makes a lot of sense. We did a deliberation on sequencing the salmon genome. No application, just sequencing it. It was part of a project to sequence the salmon genome and we were a component on it. We were, they were required to have a social, ethical, legal component. We were told by the scientists that we're only sequencing, we don't do genetic modification, that's off the table. I said, well, how do we talk to a public about sequencing the salmon genome until they can't talk about genetic modification? We won't make that the question. We'll ask them, do they trust what we can do with spy sequence in the salmon genome, do they trust the scientists? And those scientists presented. So, and we, we even had models there so people would understand what was going on. At the end of the day, they said, you know, we don't have any problem with sequencing the salmon genome, but you're sequencing the Atlantic salmon genome in Western Canada because it is the organism for aquaculture. Once you sequence it, it's more malleable. Aquaculture will introduce economic pressures and you will have genetic modification and we have no way of protecting our ecosystems and our food systems from genetically modified salmon being introduced to them. Well, the scientists were pissed off at us. They were very angry and we didn't have any policy receptors. Fisheries Canada, Environment Canada were not at all interested. And so now we do in fact go downstream and make sure we have what we call policy receptors. We want these people who we get involved in, in framing the questions to say, we're going to use this information. We're going to ask them to obey it. We're very clear with the participants. You're not telling people what to do. You're giving advice. But I, I do think that it, it becomes irresponsible sometimes to get people together to talk about something where they come up with vague principles that actually don't determine any course of action. So now you've got the principles and you can do whatever you want, really. So I, I worry about that. I worry about this one on, on um, gene editing going to the UN. I'm not sure we're at a point now where you can settle the issue as a large-scale issue, but that's the attempt. Thank you very much. Any more questions, comments? If that's not the case, I, I think that was a long day and I already see some kind of um, exhaustion. <laughs> anyway, I'd like to thank you again, Mike, for this very um, rich presentation and um, perhaps. <laughs>